everybody for coming to, oh, let's see, I guess I have to do that, uh, coming to learn about salamander communication during courtship. And so I was going to start by telling you a little bit about me, since I know you have a lot of different people coming in and presenting. So I am a, an assistant professor up at Humboldt State University, and I have a long history in science and in biology, uh, but I started out kind of generally being interested in science probably in high school, but I didn't pursue it outside of classes really until college. And they, you know, they give you this form or a checkbox and you have to say, what major are you going to be? And I was like, well, I liked biology. I think I'll just uh, check that box. And when I was in um, college, I was at Oregon State University uh, for both actually my bachelor's and my PhD. And so I explored a lot of different things while I was there. I worked in a horticulture lab. I actually made transgenic plants or at least helped <laughs> make transgenic plants there, ones that were more resistant to cold stress than they would be normally. So we put genes and they tried to turn those genes on so that they could withstand being really cold. I worked in an agricultural experiment station where I like did things like follow herds of cattle around and see where they hung out to see if like older cattle that were like experienced moms spent different times in different places uh, versus like moms that had had their first um, calves. So I did a lot of those kinds of things. I was really interested in behavior, but I actually ended up doing a lot of genetics work when I was in the horticulture lab. But I kind of came across my PhD advisor when I was, took an animal behavior course, and she works on this species here a lot, and you'll hear more about it as I go into my research. And so I really gained an appreciation for salamanders um, Yeah, later on kind of in my uh, career as a student, as I was working with her. And so that's what I'm going to tell you about is some things that we've learned. Um, and I'm still working on research questions kind of related to those species today. So I've been here at HSU. Oh, let's see, get my HSU picture uh, since 2013. Um, so Humboldt State University is part of the California State University system. It's the northernmost campus. So we're about an hour and a half from the Oregon border. Uh, it is foggy a lot of the time here, but actually it's really beautiful today. And um, there, the, also the good thing is that there's a lot of <laughs> moist habitat around and amphibians really like moist habitat. So we've got a number of them that we can work with that are really close by. So in the broader context, as we kind of talk about salamanders, I first want you to think about um, courtship more broadly and kind of like, what, what is courtship? Uh, what is the purpose of it sort of right during that time, kind of as the animals are interacting and kind of broader, like why, why do animals do courtship at all, right, in the first place? So when we define courtship kind of in our scientific context, we say it's, it's like a special set of behaviors that are happening before the actual mating itself. So it's like they're the things that happen sort of before mating. And during that time, Males and females are exchanging information. They're exchanging signals, and somebody's receiving that signal during courtship. And courtship looks right incredibly different in different kinds of animals. Right here are two octopuses. Here are some birds. Right here are some fish. In fact, all of these are exchanging what we call tactile signals right now, which is like touch. Right? They're kind of touching. They're rubbing on each other. Rubbing is like a super common behavior in courtships, and we'll see it in salamanders too. Uh, but lots of other animals do it. So there's kind of the uh, short term signaling of like what, you know, what kind of happens at that time. And then there's this longer term thing we can think about of like, why would it be there in the, in, you know, in the first place? And that's what we often say is sort of the evolutionary significance of courtship. Like what's sort of that purpose and why would it be advantageous, right, for animals to do these things. And I'm also kind of an evolutionary biologist, so I like to think about those sorts of things. It's like, well, you, know, you think about the ancestors, right, to the animals that we see living today. And I was like, well, why, you know, if they sort of start to do these sorts of things, why would those animals in the population have an advantage over others? Uh, so there's a couple things we can think of. One is 
that that time before mating is the time that they that the partners can find out information about each other um, and they can make a choice like are we going to continue right to mating or uh, is it time for us to go our separate ways like there's some sort of information that they're getting that they're like mm, you know not today and that could be information of like well what species is this right so like if there are species that are like pretty similar they might be like well from you know far away you looked like you were the right species but when i get closer I learn more about you. It's like, oh, right. There are some cues that tell me that you're actually not the same species. So we're not going to mate. So the other half of that too is this synchronization and coordination, which means kind of getting both partners set up um, so that mating will be successful. So it's like, um, is it the right time for reproduction for both partners? Um, is there other sort of aspects of like their physiology that kind of got to get lined up again so that they can successfully uh, mate and reproduce? So they're like the salamanders that the one I just showed you, it, the females of that species typically only can make eggs every two years. So they've got to like store up energy, uh, eat lots of food, and then they only have offspring every two years. So like during that other year, you know, if there was like a male comes up and it's like, oh, well, is it, you know, is it maybe time for us to make an offspring? And then there might be some cues that he's like, oh, well, actually, you know, you're not able to make eggs this year. So we're not going to actually go on to mating. So we've got that aspect too of courtship of these early interactions to try to like, you know, kind of gain information about the other partner. And so here are two snakes again, right? We see that this like touching is a really common, they're engaged in courtship behavior right here. And so those signals, like I was talking about, like how do they get information? Um, there's a number of different ways that they can do that. And we're humans, right? We think about communicating predominantly in visual signals and auditory signals, right? So if I were gonna try to like give you some information like I'm doing now, right? I'm, I'm talking and right, I'm giving you visual cues. So it's harder for us sometimes to think about, well, how right, do other animals that look differently, how can they do that? And they're in different environments too as well, right? When they're, when they're actually courting. So visual signals, and we're pretty familiar with those because it's like, oh, hey, or like I'm going to write down something and I'm going to show you, right? I'm going to communicate something that way. Uh, birds use a lot of visual signals during courtship, right? You see this peacock that's kind of fanning out um, his feathers, right? That's a signal. Um, some have hypothesized that this is like a what we call like an honest signal. So it's like if you have a big plumage, right? You have really nice, like beautiful coloration. That means that you are really successful at eating and getting food, right? You're able to produce these beautiful feathers. Um, that might be a cue that a female would um, choose and look for when she's choosing a mate. So auditory cues, those are sound. Uh, Frogs are a really common example. Also birds, right? They use a lot of calls too, uh, to their potential mates. Uh, here's a frog that's right going to be, it's got its air sacs ready to produce calls. Uh, those are pretty common. Tactile, like I was talking about before, like we saw a lot of these examples where there is some, you know, touch involved and that signals something and again with the, when we're looking at animals right we're humans we have the the types of signals we're most familiar with it's a little bit hard and we have to be careful about like well what kinds of information is being right transmitted by those behaviors and what kind of information do they gleaning there but a lot of these courtships right they're sort of like extensive grooming that can happen right these individuals are kind of or organizing their feathers or cleaning right those kinds of things are pretty common and then there are signals that are chemical um, and these types of signals right, correspond to our five senses, if you think about it. Uh, but the chemical category, if you will, kind of takes into account both like our sense of smell and our sense of taste. Those both um, have are detected, they're chemicals that we detect kind of in slightly different ways. So we often just kind of bin those, those are chemical signals. So something right, like I'm showing a perfume bottle here, um, but this, 
you know, isn't really the type of signal that we're talking about. I mean, maybe you would get a little bit of information from somebody if they sprayed perfume, but we're mostly talking about chemicals that are actually like produced by an animal itself, right? Rather than like, you know, spraying it on there or something like that. And then there is a receiver that is like sensing right that and they're getting some kind of information from that. And chemical signals are a little bit harder to study in many ways than these other ones, because you can't just like record a call and then be like, okay, I have a frog call. I'm going to go over to this frog and I'm going to play the call <laughs> right here and see what that frog does, right? What kind of like response am I going to get? Or like, if I'm like, I'm going to take a picture of this red bird and I'm going to show it, you know, like put a photo over here and I'm going to see how the possible mate will respond, which are kind of common things we do in animal behavior is sort of like see what they do, you know, to these different kinds of cues. And with chemicals, you have to actually like get them out <laughs> and then you got to like give them to the re possible like recipient and kind of see what's what response you get and it gets to be pretty challenging. So if you think about those different kinds of signals, right, we've got to overlay that or think about what kinds of signals would work in the different kinds of environments that the animals are living in. So if you had something like this, let's say, you know, you're thinking about communicating with another individual, what do you think would work well to do this? What kind of signal might you use of those four kinds? You can put it in the chat if you want, if you're can get to your chat easily. I know some, it looks like somebody's probably on their phone and I think chatting on the phone is kind of hard, but anybody have any ideas? I think you can probably direct message me or you can put it in the chat to everybody, right? Somebody's saying auditory. Definitely, because we don't see a lot of stuff, right? In, on the landscape that's going to like absorb that signal, right? There's a couple trees, but they're kind of sparse. You could probably right, call to someone and be like, hey, what are you doing over there? Uh, and that'd be pretty useful. Somebody saying also touch. Yeah, if you could get close, right? There's again, not a lot of stuff preventing you from walking over, right? And like shaking someone's hand, again, if we're thinking kind of outside courtship, but just trying to kind of get some communication going. Yep, visual was probably gonna work pretty well too, right? Because again, we've got a few trees, but if you were like, hey, I'm over here, someone's probably gonna be able to see you. You know, if you're like holding up a piece of paper from far away, maybe not, but, uh, you know, if you could make some sort of big signal, maybe if you're thinking about an animal, right, that's got like antlers or something that's like an indicator of sort of mate quality, like they have enough resources, they could grow big antlers, right, that could be seen from pretty far away. And someone's saying like vibration, right, that is, yep, that's kind of a sound, like there are some like really low sorts of calls and they actually can travel really long distances too. So that's kind of another aspect of like how close, you know, can you get? So what do you think about this one though? How about this environment? What do you think would work well if you're trying to communicate with a, a possible mate or you know just another member of of us of your species? I'm saying sound, scent, yeah. Probably not so great for visual cues, right? If you can get close enough, right? You could touch somebody if you're like. Thinking about right a dark room, you could go up and tap them on the shoulder if you wanted their attention. Um, yep, say, you know, like frog calls, right? A lot of frogs are doing their courting and same with salamanders at night, right? Something that looks like this. We might add like a pond in here and then we'd have a bunch of frogs right around our ponds. Uh, but there are some, right, signals that are gonna work less well in some environments. And so we think about kind of how would these signals have evolved again, thinking about where these animals have been, right? And where their ancestors and ancestral populations have been for a long time. So these are the salamanders that I study. And these are three representatives that are found here in California. So here's our little slender salamander right there. Here's Incitina, some really bright representatives, and then um, our wandering salamander. And I know I was trying, I was gonna look what salamanders might be where you all are in terms of their ranges. 
I learned a lot of my natural history of amphibians and reptiles from Oregon. And so I, in Oregon, so I like know a lot about the ranges up there. And I, I've been here for what, eight years. So I probably should know more, but I do a lot of genetics and stuff too. So I was like, ah, it's, I've got to start learning, learning my natural history. And there's a lot of like these slender salamanders. They've been They've been finding like new species, ones that are like, they kind of look the same, but actually genetically, we see that they're pretty different in that they haven't actually been like moving around um, and joining other populations very much. So salamanders, they're amphibians, they have moist skin, they're kind of secretive. Salamanders don't make very much noise. There are a few of them, not really of the kind I study, but they do make like uh, like a barking. <laughs> I don't know. That's, you can look up like salamander making noise on YouTube and see, but kind of like a barking-ish like alarm call if they're disturbed or you, know, you pick them up and, and they get concerned about being eaten. Uh, but for the most part, they don't really make a lot of sound. And these ones that I study here, so the plethodontid, that comes from their like specific family name, plethodontidae. And the thing that makes them unique, one of the things anyway, is that they don't have lungs. Like lungs, who needs lungs? We don't need those to breathe. <laughs> so they, they just don't have any. Um, so they're mostly pretty small. You're not going to find, you know, if you're thinking about like, have you ever seen a salamander like wandering around maybe after a rainy night? Um, if it's something much bigger than like the size of your finger, it's probably not one of these ones. They don't, there's some of the ones we collected when I was out in North Carolina. Actually, it wasn't me, but my collaborator. They're maybe like this big-ish. That's probably one of the biggest ones that there there is. So there's a few other there's like another family of salamanders that you might have seen that are bigger, but because they're lungless, they breathe through their skin. So to get the air kind of all the way into their bodies, it can't be that big. Otherwise, like the internal part is not going to get enough air. And the other thing that is interesting is they have these grooves and I'll show you a close up of their head later on. And it's like the groove is kind of like a a straw that takes like chemicals from the environment and kind of sucks it up into their nose. So it's like when they touch something, it's like all those chemicals travel, like if it's it's in the water, the water like travels right up into their kind of their olfactory place so they can like smell it. So they're like got this kind of set up so they can go around and smell stuff. So they're very attuned um, to chemical cues. And so when we kind of started out doing some of this research, there was a long history of trying to understand courtship in this family of salamanders. There's like 500 species of, of plethodontids. It's the most like species rich family. That means it's got the most species of any of the salamanders. Yes, but it's not nearly as many as like, I don't know, insects or something like that but we only have information about how they do what they do uh, before mating, how they do their courtships from maybe like less than 20% of them. Um, and if you have learned about amphibians before, you might've heard about uh, chytridiomycosis. There's a fungal disease, the chytrid fungus, and it's really been hammering amphibian populations. It's really bad for, for um, frogs, but there are some salamanders that are susceptible to it too. So understanding kind of how animals get set up and successfully mate is important for thinking about captive breeding too. And like, how do we set up a place so that these animals will successfully breed so that we can actually make new ones, right? And have like a population. Some people are doing things with amphibians. They have po captive populations and then they reintroduce them back out into the wild, right? So they're trying to like get the natural populations back up um, by supplementing with uh, the individuals that they were able to breed in the lab. Unfortunately for us, a lot of the salamanders that I study in this family don't love <laughs> to reproduce in the lab. <laughs> they are, they're really sensitive to kind of their environmental cues and they'll be like, not today, my friends, this is not the day <laughs> that we are going to court. So 
we don't have very many captive breeding programs for plethodontids, but understanding what they need, right, and kind of how they go about that will help us design some of those if and when we end up needing them. Because again, these salamanders seem like in general, they're not as sensitive to some of these diseases, but you know, we never know if there's gonna be new things coming around, new pathogens. So the first study that I wanna tell you about is trying to understand like what they do, just their behaviors um, a little bit more. And we did this comparative study where we looked at salamanders in this one genus. So this Aeneides, that's just the scientific name for these salamanders. So we have information on about six of them. Some of these accounts were like, hey, I was walking through the forest and I saw these salamanders and knowing what I know about salamanders, I realized that they were courting because they were like walking around together and we'll see kind of what they do here in a second. And so someone's like, and I just stopped to watch and I like recorded the time when they did various things. Uh, some of these, the ones that we did, we actually set them up in the lab so we can get a little bit more you know, information about how long does it take them to do various things and what are they doing? And we can actually you know, have video that I'm gonna show you of what they do to kind of help others understand because video is much easier than trying to describe with words, although we do that too. So we had these, we have these, this information from six of these, and then the three that I underlined here um, are the ones that we actually were able to go in and get some courtship information from ourselves. So the way that we do that uh, is that we get some salamanders. <laughs> They get to live in these very nice shoe boxes that you can see right here in this picture. We get uh, paper towels that are clean and not bleached so that they don't have as many chemicals. We get them wet and then we just sort of stick them on the bottom of these plastic shoe boxes so that they can get a moisture because they do need like a moist environment. But these that I mostly study are terrestrial, so they don't actually want to be in the water and they kind of flip out if they end up in the water. They're like, God, get us out of here. They just need it to be wet enough, um, but they don't want to be submerged, you know, like full on like swimming around. So this is enough for them. And then we take like a wet paper towel and we crumple it up. So they have kind of a fake, you know, fake log, fake leaves that can kind of get under there and they feel more comfortable when they have somewhere to hide. So we get those, we bring them in, um, we can feed them various things we buy, stuff, you know, small crickets and other things from the pet stores and feed them. So then we set them up in these arenas and they're usually those same kind of boxes. And we put a camera there so that they can, we can record what they're doing. And we usually use like red lights. So it's very quiet. And then you just let the video, you let the camera just sort of record them walking around the box. And then eventually if they do go ahead and court and complete mating, um, we'll go, we'll look at the, um, video and we'll time, right, kind of keep a note of when they do various things to get an idea of how long it takes them to do various uh, courtship behavior so we can compare that between the species and kind of say like, oh, what's similar? What's different, right? Is there something that we could do where that like all of them kind of do this thing uh, versus the there's only there's like this really unique thing that only this one does. Um, and is there something we could potentially do, right, so that they would be happy, <laughs> happier mating in the lab? So there are kind of four general stages that they go through most kinds of plethodontids. And then each one of them seems to have like their own kind of special take on these four general stages. So the first thing that usually happens is what we call orientation. So it's pretty much when you see one animal, it's like, oh, hey, there's another animal in this box. <laughs> and they just walk over and they're like, oh, hey, uh, let me see if I can learn something about you. So when they make that contact, then you actually kind of say like, oh, that's the next stage. They're kind of touching each other. And in fact, I think in this one, almost, they might almost be to contact there. Um, but then you're kind of getting, when you're kind of taking a stopwatch and you're like, okay, and now they're on to contact. Then they'll do that again for some number of minutes. And then they move on to this really interesting behavior that we call tail straddling walk. And just, it is kind of what it sounds like, where it's like one walks along straddling, like legs on both sides of the other one's tail. Um, and we, we don't see this in any other kind of salamander, but pretty much all of them in this family, all 500 do this for various um, lengths of time. And it's also cool because 
this is the female following the male. So in these salamanders, the female is kind of the one who's running the show. She's deciding, like, am I going to remain in courtship? I'm going to, like, continue walking forward with you or walking around with you, or am I going to leave? And I'm just going to, you know, I just step over the tail and I walk away. So that kind of shows her kind of receptivity, how like interested she is in mating. And then the last stage is the male will lay a little spermatophore and the female will pick it up. And that's mating would be completed after that stage, stage four. So again, we can look and see what the animals are doing and we can, from the videos, or we also sometimes do this in person where we sit like very, very quietly and we watch them for long amounts of time and you could kind of tally sometimes we'll do like a scan so you might have like 10 boxes you're responsible for and you'll just scan across and you just note like what are they doing okay uh, orientation tail straddling walk nothing right and then you just kind of go back so you might do that for like two or three hours in a cold room at night <laughs> so you have to be very patient to work with these species and you can't move quickly because even under low light, you know, if they see your arms or something, uh, it'll distract them and they'll be like, oh, oh, what were we doing? So it's uh, that I spent a lot of my PhD sitting quietly with lots of clothes on in our cold room because they prefer a temperature like maybe like 63, 64 degrees. So it's not freezing cold, but you know, if you're sitting really quietly, you want to have some something layered on to keep you comfortable. And so when we do that, we can do things like make a table of the information that we've got so we can compare across species. So the, these are the information that we have from minutes of time that they spend doing different kinds of stuff. So we have orientation, OR, head contact, uh, tail straddling walk, TSW, and then spermatophore deposition. And these are the four that we actually have like numbers for. So in the other ones, we just kind of have like a description. Somebody didn't actually, you know, wasn't able to like time everything. So they're, so you can see that like how, what they do in these different, or how long, I guess they spend doing different things varies a lot. So you know, the orientation often is fairly short. So the main number there, like three for the clouded salamander, that's just three minutes. And then underneath in parentheses, those that's the range. So if you have more than one animal, you have more than one courtship, it's like, oh, well, some animals are spending as little as one, some are spending as much as five minutes. Um, so that you can see like, they spend a lot of time in head contact, like rubbing, right? That tactile communication. So like for the clouded salamander, that's like three and a half hours. Can you imagine like sitting there and they're actually kind of rubbing like this on somebody for three hours? Cause that's what they were doing. <laughs> and even like the black salamander, right? That's like an hour and a half on average that they spend doing this. So you know, you're thinking about the salamanders just kind of out there. It's like, they're doing complicated stuff, right? And it is taking them a while to get that coordination kind of set up where it's like, all right, well, is it, is it actually time to me? And a lot of that we think is like they're transferring chemical cues. We'll talk about that. Um, they're probably also kind of assessing, you know, that tactile behavior. It's like, all right, well, is that, are you the same species as me? And that's kind of, you're acting like I expected, or are you acting a little bit different? Um, right, and sort of exchanging information during that time. And then they walk around together, a uh, tail straddling walk for like, again, like three and a half hours in some of these species, or maybe almost four hours, just like, walking around, um, you can just sort of imagine them on the forest floor, they're just walking around. Although some of these species live up in like the trees and you're like, whoa, what are you doing up there? <laughs> like, how do you walk around? Uh, we'll see probably how they do that. Um, here, I'll show you some videos. Or like, you know, kind of like under maybe a log or something where there's enough space where they can still walk, but you know, get, do that walk for a while. Yeah, so it's very, you know, it, and it varies a lot between these species. And what is it that creates so many species colors? Yeah, and it's really interesting because the, the they they have some really beautiful different colors, but you're like, well, for the most part, they're like hiding under logs most of the time. <laughs> they don't. And I was like, and if you're in the dark courting, you can't really see that well. 
right? So it doesn't really seem like having different colors is going to be that useful. For some of the other species, they think it is some like it deters predators. Like if you see a bright color, a predator has learned like, ooh, bright color, that's going to be a poisonous species. I better not eat it. So there is some thought that some of those colors have to do with like predator, like keeping those predators away from them. Um, and there are like, let's see, yeah, you would probably have some of these like rougher skinned salamanders which we call newts and they have like a bright orange belly you might have seen these ones actually do unlike the little guys i study they do like walk around sometimes and they're super chill because they are very very toxic it's like they'll eat something will eat them and you'll see like them crawl out of its dead body because they poisoned it with a toxin so don't lick any salamanders that you find around. But so some of it, yeah, has to do with kind of that, that toxin and then the avoidance. And some species like kind of take advantage of that. They're like, we're not toxic, but we look like this other species that is toxic. And so we also got avoided, we get that benefit. So one of the cool or a couple of the cool things that we saw when we looked at the videos were some things that had never been noticed by anybody else. One thing is this circular, walking so usually it's like this linear thing like you see down here in panel d where the males in front and the females and they just sort of like wander about um but many of them would spend their time like kind of wrapped around each other like this which was really unusual and again we think might be related to like being up on like a branch and you don't you can't really walk around that much because you'll come up to the end of the branch right or you like walk off the side so but if you go around in a circle right you're kind of you don't need that much space for your courtship we also saw that there were some female behaviors that really hadn't been recorded that often um, where the females were really active participants they were like going up they were starting the head rubbing they would undulate their tails which just means we'll see that in a video like kind of like lift their tail region up and kind of like wiggle it around um, which typically is more common for males to do but there just seems like the females were also being pretty active in the courtship encounters I'll see if this will play. You can see here, we'll look at um, that circular behavior. These videos are kind of old, so I apologize. They're not the greatest, but that's what you get when you were doing stuff in 2000. And I'll show you one from like the 70s <laughs> here in a second. But right, they just kind of like walk around. Sometimes they kind of get, I don't know, startled, and then they have to kind of re right, organize themselves there. But they'll do that for. Yeah, for hours. So this ones are like, oh, and when they're in these boxes, it gets a little bit challenging because they get, you know, they kind of get like stuck <laughs> on the sides. Like they're like, I'm trying to walk. And the males be like, uh oh, we've hit the edge. And then they're like, you know, they kind of like rebound off of the <laughs> sides of the box. So looking at those kinds of um, videos and written accounts of the behavior, people were like, yeah they do spend a lot of time kind of rubbing on each other and if we look at them and look at like you know kind of what their body is like some of them have these giant glands under their chin so this is like an extreme example here and these glands are only there when it's breeding time for them so for this species it's kind of in summer so they're not there any other time of year and when they look inside and actually kind of like looked at the chemicals like what's actually in there they found that they were proteins there's all just like a ton of protein in there and during the courtship if they looked like the males were going around and like touching that gland all over the females in various ways. And I'll show you a couple examples. And it was like, this seems pretty clear that they're putting those proteins, that stuff that's put it, it's made in the gland onto the females um, at that, you know, during the courtship. And then the question is, well, you know, why, like what impact might that have on the females? You know, what does that mean for the courtship as a whole? So the two major ways that they found out that they're doing that is there's one called that we call scratching. <laughs> These names are sore. I really do not like the, the second name, but it's like once someone kind of calls it something in science, often you use the same term until maybe someone can come up with a better one. But the scratching way is like imagine that you have you kind of got your your teeth 
And then you're going to go over and you're going to kind of scratch like this. And then that gland, right, got those chemicals in there. You're just going to like wipe it on that scratch. And what we think is that, let's go this way, that introduces those chemicals actually into the bloodstream, right? So into the animal so they can kind of circulate in the animal's body. Um, we haven't actually discovered where, like, is it going to the brain eventually? We think so, but we haven't really shown that yet, but it's our best guess. And so these chemicals, um, we often, you'll see me use the word pheromone, which is a more precise name for chemicals that are signals between two individuals in the same species. So you have to be like knowing that you have some behavioral influence of um, your chemical to be able to call it a pheromone. Um, it just kind of, I will use them interchangeably, but I just wanted to be like, you know, you've probably heard about pheromones maybe before it's like, oh, that, you know, giving off the pheromones or something like that, right? It's just like some, it's a specific sort of within a species, like, uh, you know, cue that's uh, exchanged between them. And I think it depends on what size of device you're on here, but you might be able to see the scratches here on this lower picture of a female who was in a box with a male um, overnight. And you can see like how her skin is actually, you know, pretty abraded uh, by that male. And they actually have these like kind of elongated teeth that really allow them to scratch. So I think here's an example. This one is the very old <laughs> video here of a male who's he's kind of on the back side and you can see right he's kind of rubbing on her like sort of her shoulder blades and really kind of getting right kind of his whole body into that curving around and kind of putting and his teeth and his gland kind of go together you know like you can't really see the difference between like is it the gland or is it the teeth because they're all right there but that is an example of scratching and then we have this other one it's the olfactory delivery mode, and they call it slapping, which I, again, I was like, I don't love that. So I try not to really use that uh, term. But instead of it being like the chemicals end up, you know, inside the body and like the bloodstream, in this way, it's delivered like right to the nose, basically. And the male takes that gland and he just sort of taps the female on the nose, you know, her nose is shaped differently than mine. So what it does is it actually puts those chemicals kind of right in that area where it's going to be sucked up into the nose. So they're like, they're like putting it right there for the females to smell, essentially. And that usually happens during that tail straddling walk because the female is like right there. And so the male kind of turns around and she's like right there. And he's like, OK, here, let me just like deliver you a little pheromone because um, we're walking around. And we've shown that these pheromones do kind of go inside of the olfactory cavity, right, where you sense your sense of smell and are going to activate the sensory cells in there and kind of send signals up to the brain. And let's see if we can get the video here to go and see what that looks like, actual animals. So the male was in front there again, just giving her, do it one more time with this little pet, kind of giving her right kind of a tap there. The female is the one behind. You can see the male kind of, you know, oh, that's the tail undulations I was talking about either, right? Kind of moves his tail back and forth as they're walking around. So when we see, you know, we've got this gland, it's making something, it's pretty easy to be like, well, it's making some protein because you have different ways you can like stain the protein and kind of know what it is. But we don't know like which one in particular, because proteins can be made up of a lot of different building blocks, it can be tons of unique types of proteins. So to get at that, we do things like um, take the male's glands <laughs> and get those proteins uh, out of there by doing what we call extraction and, and it's actually studying them. So we get the, here's me, this is my, the, me doing a, a surgery, what we call like a, a gland removal surgery. So we're just taking out that part of their body. Uh, they recover from this. Um, we very carefully kind of uh, cut into the skin, just take the gland, put it back there. They're under anesthesia. And actually we usually do this. Like I have to be looking at them through a microscope because they're so small, you know, like it's a, it's like microsurgery. And then 
um, they go on to like an antibiotic sort of solution. They, we allow them to recover. And then if we want to see like how their behavior changes, the females, when we give them pheromones, we have to kind of take out those, you know, the delivery of the chemicals by the males themselves. So that's why we kind of take the males so they can't give anything of their own because they don't have their glands anymore. Uh, but we can put them together and then we can give them back. We give the females experimentally, we give them a little like dose. We're like, oh, you want a little dose of this pheromones? And so down here, you can see what that looks like. This is not to scale. <laughs> this is something my collaborator made. But if you've ever seen a micro pipette, it's kind of this long, thin thing and you have these little tips on there and you can suck up super small amounts of liquid in there and like like just like put a tiny amount so somebody who has very um <laughs> they're like the calmest one they haven't been drinking coffee or anything gets to then very slowly and carefully take that micro pipette and they're just going to put like a tiny drop of fluid onto the female's nose and they've got to do it so slow because again they're really flighty and it's like oh there's a giant human hand right coming towards me in this box and sometimes they'll kind of get scared and run away but often then they'll go kind of back together and they'll continue their courtship and so we will do that multiple times and again we'll just kind of time how long it takes them to kind of go through courtship, right? Those major stages that I talked about before. It's like, all right, how long is it taking you to go to orientation? How long have you spent in, you know, walking around that arena for a while? And in this case, usually we're there in person to see what's going on because we do have to deliver pheromones and we do it at uh, specific times. So you're like in sitting there for several hours in the cold, watching and then very occasionally like going in and putting a little bit on their nose. And so what we found is that there is behavioral effects. And at first, uh, my collaborators did like everything in the gland. They just like sucked it all out, all the different proteins and put it on. But then they started being more precise of like, well, we've got different ones in there. We can use um, biochemical methods to like separate out all the different stuff. You can just kind of think of it that way. and if we look at there, like these sorts of graphs, you can imagine like each of these peaks is showing you a different thing. So it's like, oh yeah, there's a bunch of different stuff in there. <laughs> That's what the peaks show. And, and using these kinds of separation methods kind of, oh, what they do is that over time, different stuff kind of comes off of the machine. So you can kind of gather it up. So you can do that and you can test individual types of protein, individual different things to be like, okay, well, what does this specific chemical do? What does this specific chemical do? Uh, so I'll show you, there's a couple of them we've worked with a lot. They have, I don't know, sort of complicated names for reasons I'm not clear about because I was not involved in their naming, but they're just such as kind of a name for that particular kind of chemical. And we can also do things like look at what we think the structure of them might be. So the first one is called plethodontid receptivity factor because it's from a plethodont and salamander, right? And it has to do with increasing receptivity or like increasing the likelihood of mating. And in particular, what it does is it actually is shortening the courtship time. So when females get it, uh, they proceed through courtship faster. So here's what it looks like, in what we at least think on the like molecular level. So you can use programs to kind of be like, what is it? What might it look like? You know, what might the protein look like? on this very, very small level. And they look really cool because you can make, make them different colors. I mean, they're not, they're not really those different colors, um, but the different parts of it, you can color in different ways with programs. Um, and here, hopefully you can see the little, again, it depends on how big of a screen you're looking at, but the little tiny um, groove that's leading kind of from the edge of the mouth uh, up to the opening of the olfactory cavity, right? So it's like taking chemicals right up there. So what we found is that the this protein, it shortens that courtship time. So that's where what we mean when we say like it's increasing receptivity. It's making those courtships shorter. They're kind of getting to mating faster, which could be good for both the male and the female because uh, they've got other things to do. 
<laughs> right? They need to go forage. Um, if they are courting in more of an open area, right, they're exposed to possible predators, you know, things that are going to eat them. Um, so there could be advantages to having a shorter courtship if you're like getting the signal. It's like, okay, that's the signal that I'm looking for. Um, let's be like, go ahead and, you know, we'll let's shorten our courtship and get this done. There's another one that is and again, has a kind of complicated name, sort of friend precursor like factor. It's also a more uh, widely found protein, like all the species that we've looked at within this family have it. You can see what it looks like. It's, um, let's get that going here. Where's the, that's what it looks like again on a very small, small level. And it does the same thing though. That's kind of interesting because it's like a different protein, it's a different chemical, but it still decreases that courtship time. So it seems like different species have different chemicals, but they kind of have the same purpose, which is pretty interesting. And this one is actually related to other chemicals that are made by different um, salamanders that are like not, not within the same family, but some newts that are in Japan. And they they also use these kinds of things, but they use them for attracting mates because they're aquatic. And so they like to kind of go out into the water and the females sense it and they're like, oh, time to go. And they'll just follow like that scent back through the water. So it's like two different salamanders, super different um, courtships, but kind of using some of the same chemicals during the courtships. And so some of the kind of more recent things that we're trying to do is look outside of these couple of species that we spend a lot of time looking at and be like, well, what's going on? Like how different are these chemicals and what have we yet to learn, right? About what's in there and what kind of impacts they have on the females. So we can do that same, these are the same kinds of charts I was showing you before, where again, you can just kind of focus on the peaks and it's like, is there a peak in the same place, you know, across them or are they different? And what you can see, right, is that there's a lot of difference between these are three species um, and the two that are start with a P kind of deliver to the nose. And then the one that starts with an O is one of the ones that's like scratching, right, and rubbing on the skin. And so there's some commonalities between the ones that deliver to the nose. It's like we've in these shorthand are some of the, the ac acronyms for the pheromones. So the ones we already know. Uh, there's also some though there, right? There's some like peaks in the middle that aren't labeled. It's like, well, what are those things? They're in pretty high because the peak you can imagine is like roughly related to concentration. It's like, well, what do those ones do? Why is there so much of it in there? Like, you know, they have these special glands that they only make during the breeding season and they're making a lot of that thing. And we don't know what that thing does yet in terms of um, is there information there, right? Does it have some sort of effect? I um, even the receptivity, we're like, well, is that, yeah, like how does the female use that pheromone information? Why are courtships, you know, shorter? And is it kind of maybe different subtypes have slightly different effects or things like that? So we still have a lot to learn about, like, what are the chemicals, you know, doing specifically? And the other side is the side really that we haven't explored a lot, but um, I'm really excited about and want to explore more. And I've just actually gotten a grant with one of my other, the, another professor here to try to understand the female side more and to understand like how they are sensing these pheromones. And what we know is the most tetrapods, which are limbed animals, Kind of have two like within the cavity that i'll show you they're kind of two types um, of sensory systems in there and the pheromones are like detected by one and stuff that like you kind of smell like food smells and things are detected by the other one so we're really interested in being like well is that true in the salamanders and like what actual cells are involved in like this sensing of the pheromones and so here you already saw this one and but you can see the blue and the pink better in this second diagram here that's kind of like what their that's like what their nasal cavity looks like right we can think about what ours might look like they've got this nasal cavity and the two colors are those two different um, populations of like sensory cells and we're trying to see like all right well where do the pheromones um 
activate neurons? Are they, you know, which populations of cells are sensing those chemical cues? And what it looks like is that they're mostly in that pink area there, which is like, you can kind of imagine it as like a, almost like a tube that's running around kind of the very outside of their nasal cavity. And what's super interesting is that when you put like chemicals on the outside of their nose, those chemicals, like sh they kind of go, they flow up and like right into that area. So that's like the key sensing part for all these chemicals that are in their environment as well, because they go around and like tap on stuff and like, like, hey, what's over there? What's over there? Right. I mean, they're also getting, you know, the females are also getting those chemicals from the males during courtship, but they're also like sensing a lot of other stuff. And so this area is probably really important for lots of different kinds of cues. Um, some of these salamanders are quite territorial. They'll fight off other individuals. They're able to tell like, you know, if you have like different scents from males and females, they'll like detect that and they'll choose to like spend time in different areas. So they really are what like attuned to all of these chemicals that are in their environment. So what we're trying to do is things like this, which is actually hone in on some of these cells. And so I'm showing you here, this is like, if you imagine taking the head and then, you know, kind of cutting through, you're looking at a section of that kind of channel on the outside and all of those places that are blue, right? Kind of little blue blobs here. Those are cells that are expressing a particular gene that we think is important for detecting um, its product, the protein that it encodes. Got a little genetics there. But anyway, that cell, the way it's set up, it is um, probably involved in that detection that, of those chemicals that they're getting. And so we're trying to figure out like, well, which ones exactly and how does that work? But it is a, is a big work in progress. So a few conclusions here, I'll finish up and hopefully there'll be a little bit of time for questions. Um, you know, our behavioral observations, were, that's like still where we are because it's giving us insight into these really secretive organisms that we wouldn't understand um, in any other way. And like I said, they're very challenging to try to breed captively, right? And, you know, potentially be helping some of the populations in the future. So they've got these protein pheromones, right? The chemicals that they use, really important. They're probably used by most species, almost all based on the presence of those glands. Even when the ones we don't actually have any information about their behavior, we know that they've got a gland, almost all of them. And, you know, we're using these salamanders to help us understand more generally kind of what's going on during courtship, you know, especially in these species that are living at night and they're like hanging out in these environments where some other types of cues don't work, you know, how much do they rely on those signals and ultimately what are those signals kind of telling them and how do they make those decisions about their possible mates, right, using those chemicals. So this is just an acknowledgement that sometimes typical for um, like life sciences presentations of all the people who helped me and some of the funding sources that have been involved in giving money so, so that we can so study these little guys. So I will end there um, and I'm super happy to answer any questions you might have. I'll get my screen share off too. Anybody have any questions? I've taken notes. <laughs> <laughs> I have one and then um, in case someone else has one, just jump right on in. Um, my first question, which areas have several different species? Um, is there a particular place, maybe not even in the United States that has several different species? Yeah, so there, are a few different like hot spots we call them for salamanders and actually one of them is in the Appalachians um, in the east that's like for the plethodontids that's like a hot spot so that's where I would do a lot of my field work when I was doing my graduate work is we would go to North Carolina for a month every year and collect there um, and then broader like outside of the little lungless ones that I study I'm trying to think think where there might be a lot. 
maybe around there are a lot of the lungless ones too actually in like central america there's a lot of little small ones that people didn't really know a lot about and there's like a high biodiversity there i know a lot about the plethodontids but like the newts there's some there's lots of newts in europe but there there not aren't as many newts um overall as there are the little i don't know being lungless i guess is a really good strategy if you're self <laughs> there are a lot <laughs> Uh, we're talking yeah. about that. Um, yeah, I I heard about a blind salamander. Have you, oh yeah. Have yep. you studied those and and what are the differences between the others and and the blind ones? Because I I heard that um they live a lot longer than some of the other ones. Huh. I I do not know about like their lifespan. There are some ones again in the same family in Texas that are blind and they like are some of them are like in the aquifers that they use for like the cities use for water. So I don't know that like, carefully like pull out from the areas that they uh, where the salamanders aren't. But yeah, they you know, they their ancestors having eyes was equally not you know like that's like why do we need eyes we could use those resources for other things right we could use those resources to make more offspring and it's like eventually they just kind of lost the ability but they to see and i think they're doing okay except for in some of those places where they're like drawing a lot of water out and i think they are protected some of them too but they they are very strange looking if you've ever seen them they're like and they don't really have much like color to right. them, they're just kind of like white walking around. And, right, right. And I, I yeah. would, I would have uh, before. I would have thought that it was a um, a blind salamander. I would have probably said it was an albino or something like that because. Um, yeah, and it's you know most many of the salamanders have like these big like i think very cute like googly eyes but <laughs> the blind ones if you can look kind of get a front view yeah they're like heads are just sort of like flat because the eyes are you know really there anymore well, that was interesting. thank you i wanted to find out if you've written any or, or uh, published any papers yeah yeah and part of being a professor usually is like you have kind of research duties you have teaching duties and then you have like service or on committee work and so part of my the research stuff is like you're also yeah um i don't know if required is the right word but expected to publish your findings and so i have published probably like i try to publish a paper a year sometimes there's a few more sometimes a little bit less uh yeah and I've actually been doing more work kind of on population structure recently, of like how different different populations are genetically. And I'm kind of moving back into the whole factory stuff because we just got some money to do that. Oh, and I see somebody, let's see, in the chat, are salamanders poisonous? Yes, some of them. Um, yeah. Not the little ones that I study for the most part. Some of them are like distasteful, but they wouldn't kill you like if a human ate them. Um, but like the rough skin newts, let's see, down by you, where is that contact zone? They might be California newts. Uh, but if you see something that has like rough skin and a like orange belly, yeah, those are, they have a toxin called tetrodotoxin, which is the same thing a puffer fish has. And there have been like things like, cases where somebody like ate one on a dare and went into cardiac arrest and just no no good so and then i've heard other things again like urban legends where they've crawled into like a backpacker's like coffee mug and they didn't notice and like drank the coffee and died that one is not substantiated so i'm not sure but yeah they they can't though that type um and they are very they're really cool and you can pick them up and stuff you just want to make sure you wash your hands like it's not going to like leach through your skin or anything you just don't want to get it like in you know inside of your body and uh let's see any do you know of any other animals that use protein glands kind of in this way there are actually some new stuff that's showing that some frogs actually do communicate with proteins it's less common because a lot of them use you know like the the auditory calls they've got they most of them have that but uh, there's like a tailed frog that we have up here that doesn't really make much noise and they think that they can communicate with some um, chemical cues and um let's see a mice have some that they actually have in their urine <laughs> and so they they scent mark with urine and they like 
pee on stuff. And it's like, this is my zone. This, and they're kind of, they can actually be like individually kind of different composition. And so they're like, this is mine. This is your area. We, you know, again, we'll like establish territories in that way. And then someone's asking, what is your favorite part of your job? Um, I like, I like that my job actually has a lot of different jobs inside it. Uh, so different professors at different universities have different amounts of teaching and research and service. So my university, my teaching is actually a fair amount. My research is like maybe, so it's maybe like 60%, 30%, 10%. Um, and I like all of those pieces. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm doing a lot of teaching, but then the summer I do like a lot of research. So it's really variable and it's like, keeps me getting to do new things. And I'm like, I wanna try this like new way of teaching. And I was like, oh, I wanna get into lab and do this. So it's, it's nice to have those different pieces. I have done things where I like only taught or only did research. And it is, it's nice to be able to take some of that research and like put it in your classes um, and spend some time, you know, talking with students, not just like sitting. I mean, I do have lab people too, but like not just like sitting by myself in my lab. So I like most of those things. And then how many salamanders are there? Total, I should know this, but I don't. I would say maybe like 900 total. So the plethodont is the family I study, makes up most of them. And then there are nine other salamander families that have somewhere between like as little as four and maybe as many as a hundred or so species, but there are many more frogs than there are salamanders. And somebody's asking about, I heard some scientists were working on a specific type of salamander to study their ability to regenerate appendages. Yes, so those are a different family, the family in Bistamatidae. The uh, kind of lab model organism was the axolotl, which are native to Mexico and especially around like Mexico City. Uh, but they have taken them and they have lab populations now. They have like a big breeding program and they, yeah, can like, they do things like just cut off a limb and then they will watch it regrow. Not all salamanders can do that. Like the ones I study, they can't remake everything. I think they can like grow like a, like a finger um, but not as well as the axolotls. So they do a lot of, yeah, like tissue regeneration and trying to understand how that works with axolotls, which is sort of sad. I mean, I imagine that they give them um, anesthetics and stuff so they don't feel pain. Now we have a lot of committees in place to make sure animals are treated humanely, but it is like, I was like, I don't know if I could do those types of studies, but they, it really helps with like understanding like wound healing, right. And other vertebrates too. And so how does that go? And like, what actually, you know, is turn, like what sort of expression turns on when you have those kinds of injuries. So there's a lot of applic medical applications there. Um, one of my favorite projects, I think that this, well, I actually have an interesting project that I'm working on these other little, like another little salamander that looks really similar, but it's actually in a different family and trying to understand like what it's doing north and south of this river, because they seem like they're really different and we don't know why. So that's kind of a recent thing that I'm just looking at my data and trying to understand, but I, I have like a fondness for most of my projects. Like I didn't start off like I said, like loving amphibians. Some people are like really into herps and I wouldn't say it was that kind of person. In fact, I was like, oh, they're kind of like cold and slimy, but salamanders, they don't bite. I mean, they can, there's, some of them will try, but they're just so small and usually they're just very calm. And if you don't pinch them, which is, you know, they would think you're trying to eat them and you can just kind of hold them. So I think that I've really had like grown in that appreciation of like, oh yeah. And they're secretive, you know, you don't usually see them. So it's kind of fun to be like, yes, I found one. Uh, they have that kind of going for them. Do I allow students to help with my studies? And then what characteristics do I recommend for a student? And what I recommend probably working? Um, so I have uh, undergraduate students, so people who are working on their bachelors of science, as well as people who are working on their masters of science. Uh, and occasionally here at Humboldt State, we do have um, high schoolers who come in in the summers and will work in labs as well. And I would say if you're interested in research as a career, um, that it might be fun to do that. I think it's kind of like, oh, or maybe you are, you know, you're interested, but you're not sure. This will give you a really short time to kind of try that out. And 
I would imagine there are programs more in your area because you're in a bigger area too to kind of have high schoolers go into university labs and do some stuff. Or there's also, if you're more interested in like the ecology wildlife angle to see if there's internships with like um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I think sometimes they have opportunities for, I mean, definitely for undergraduates, but as high schoolers as well. And I think really the characteristics that people look for is like, you are reliable, you can come and you show up, or if you can't come, you let somebody know um, and that you're interested. And I think a lot of it is like, you are going to be training and learning while you're there. So you don't have to know everything's showing up, right? It's like, I'm, but I'm really interested in learning this and I wanna know more and I wanna develop some skills, right? Cause that's the other piece is that often you'll be learning something different than you've learned in your classes. And so that's gonna be, even if you don't end up doing that exact same thing, right? That's kind of giving you something there as well. And then someone's asking, is it more of a in the field job or a lab job? Um, that varies by year. It kind of depends. Like I'd say in the last few years, I've been doing more of a lab job. It's actually pretty challenging to get permits for collecting in California. So when I started my job, I worked with a lot of people who had collected tissues as well. Um, often what you can do is take like a little bit of a salamander tail. They'll, they'll regrow their tails too. I should have mentioned that. Uh, so it doesn't really hurt them, but then you have a little tissue that you can sample. Uh, to do the olfactory stuff, you kind of do have to sacrifice them because you have to kind of get into this area of their head and there's not really a way to do that otherwise. Uh, but then there are years like where I spent, you know, a month or two in the field, like most of a summer. Um, now, because I teach, I'm here mostly doing lab stuff in the academic year, you know, from like August to May. And then is in this field, do you study other things about salamanders or mainly just courting? Um, trying to think back. I've done a little bit of work on um their growth and development um, and how long they're like we tried to rear eggs and see kind of how long their developmental period is and how long the females actually can like store the sperm that they get for a long time and then they can make eggs like way later and so sort of seeing like oh well who's the father how long can they do that um, but mostly focused on like reproductive biology of them it's because I was doing work with animals in North Carolina, we would ship them back to Oregon and we had a big lab there. So it was hard to do like ecology stuff if you wanted to do that year round because we would have needed to go back to North Carolina. But there's certainly a lot we don't know about like the species right here. I mean, here in California, and we have many of the similar ones actually up in Oregon, kind of this because uh, it's similar-ish, you know, habitat in the Pacific Northwest. Not maybe it's as far south as you are, but they're you know, there's a lot of similarities. So I'm hoping to do more work out in the field, but the permits are kind of backed up now because of COVID. And I think everybody was like trying to get out last summer or like this summer. So a ton of people submitted permits in the spring. So we're still waiting because you have to have a permit before you touch an animal or do anything to it, which is rightly so. It's just like, well, we're waiting and we really want to get out there. So we just have to be patient. I think those were all the questions if oh, I didn't were it? okay I was uh I was wondering because I don't see them on my there must be going straight to you that's great I I have never learned so much about a salamander in one day <laughs> and you never will again no I say you oh might <laughs> well I I did I just have one last question yep they're all done um global warming How's that affected the salamander behavior, even um, since you started um, studying them? Have you noticed any any differences? We haven't noticed differences in behavior, but the concerning thing for some of the species that we study is that they they kind of have like different parts of like the mountain that they hang out in and so it's like there's one that's like on the top and then there's one kind of in the middle and what happens is that it's warming the ones in the middle are like marching kind of up the mountain and they're starting to come in contact with like the higher species and in some cases they're not like entirely sort of separate yet so they might actually start like breeding with the other species which you know, I don't know if that's good or bad, but now you don't have really those distinct 
groups anymore, right? You might end up with a kind of one group and, or you're going to like lose, right? If this mountaintop one, if it gets too warm there, you know, this one's kind of moving up and this one is like, it's kind of warming and they're not doing very well and you might just lose it entirely. So though those kinds of things where like their ranges are shifting and they're overlapping more where they don't really have anywhere else to go because they're already kind of in the coolest area they can be are concerning, but they are pretty good at like finding little like tiny places that are good for them, you know, like find, maybe they are going to burrow down a little deeper, right? And that's a little bit cooler, like before they would make a burrow this shallow, maybe they're going to go down here. Um, so we're hoping that they, you know, can kind of make it through. It might not be all of the species, but, and these are the ones mostly in like the Appalachians that there's some evidence again, that they're kind of starting to overlap more than they used to. Right. Yeah. Thank you.